you may open your Bibles now, 2 Timothy <coughs> chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. <coughs> And I'm going to read uh, the first two verses. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm going to stop here. You know, after the book of Romans, and I was thinking and praying about which book to take next, a couple of books I was thinking, and uh, finally I decided to take a second Timothy. So, <clears throat> that is what you are going to hear but I, I, I will assure you that it is not going to be like Romans. It will be much faster than that. And uh, it won't take seven years. Well, <clears throat> we know that a few years ago, I think before COVID, uh, Brian took a few lessons from this uh, Second Timothy. And I hope you remember that. And I, as soon as Brian finished that session, I told him that, oh, Brian, I need uh, all your notes. You know, give me all the notes. And I was thinking that I will uh, immediately start because he already laid the foundation so I can build on that. But it didn't work out because of the COVID and all. And uh, then I was thinking about the, about the book of Hebrews. And I thought, you know, if I take Hebrews, it is going to take forever and ever. So I decided to take this one. So prayerfully, we will consider a sort of a fast study from the book of uh, uh, Second Timothy. <clears throat> and I'm going to take a couple of Sundays uh, uh, to give an introduction. Then we'll go uh, uh, the word study. Now. <clears throat> Paul wrote these epistles uh, in his second imprisonment at Rome. You know, Paul was in prison many times. He was in prison in Philippi. He was in prison in uh, Jerusalem. And uh, he was uh, prison in, in Caesarea. And then once in Rome before this time. <clears throat> but this time is much different from his... Uh, first time imprisonment in uh, Rome. In the first time, even though he was in prison, he enjoyed much freedom. And he could stay in his own rented house. And he could preach the kingdom of God and also Jesus Christ. And many were saved. And uh, we uh, know that even the household of Caesar, it is mentioning, they are saved. When you see about, when you hear about the household of Caesar, it doesn't mean that somebody from his family. It's sort of all those who are associated with uh, Caesar, even the soldiers. It's sort of like our, we normally say, the White House staff. When you say the White House staff and all those who are associated with the president and all. So they have to, the staff of Caesar have to communicate and contact with the Paul because he is a, a prisoner. And not only that, and uh, Paul in his first imprisonment, he was changed to a Roman soldier, even though he was changed to a Roman soldier, and uh, he enjoyed much freedom. <clears throat> he could entertain people, he could speak the gospel, and, uh, uh, but this is not like that. Even that time, he wrote uh, the Ephesians, <clears throat> Philippians and Colossians and Philemon that we normally call as the prison epistles. And he wrote from there. And if you read the prison epistles, I mean, we can get, we can surmise that he was expecting immediate release from the, from the prison. Because we, he, we, we can read. 
in when he was writing to the philippians he said that i was he was planning to visit uh, philippi and also he was planning to visit uh, uh, philemon in colossi so there we can see that he was expecting to be out of prison <clears throat> and not only that and that was the point that luke concluded the book of acts you know if you read the last uh, uh, section <clears throat> of of the book of acts and luke was so, uh, saying about describing about his imprisonment then we don't see any history and that is the end we see in the book of acts but he was expecting to be out of the prison and then <clears throat> he is out of the prison now probably about ad 60 to 62 he was in prison but this is the this is the the important thing about him as soon as he get got out of prison he did not say that okay i was in prison so i need some time to recuperate there is no break as soon as he is out of the prison he continue his mission you know that is one thing we need to learn about paul he was a man with a uh, 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 full of you know the, the consumed by the mission that he was called to do so as soon as he get out of the prison he started his ministry it doesn't matter to me whether is inside the prison or outside the prison he speaks the gospel can you just imagine in the first imprisonment this is my imagination he was changed to a roman soldier and they changed the shift every 8 hours or every 12 hours i don't know what was the deal. think about as somebody is is chained to roman soldier uh, to paul and what will be the discussion of paul paul is not going to talk about politics or weather or anything and i believe that every 8 hour he was converting a, a soldier and that is what heard many from the the household of caesar accepted christ this man is consumed with the mission and that is what whether is the inside the prison or the outside the prison he does not wait for an opportunity to come every opportunity every incident is an opportunity to tell the gospel and that is the mindset of paul and the remaining when he get out of the prison we do not know much about how he was doing because the luke concluded the book of acts when he was in prison he was about to be released but most of the information that we can get from the letters that he wrote afterwards out of the prison <clears throat> we normally call as the pastoral episodes we get uh, the first and second timothys and titus so most of the informations that we get what paul was doing and from this pastoral episodes so i want to give you some idea we can grasp from this <clears throat> pastoral episodes and the first one if you read the first timothy there we get the idea that he traveled to macedonia probably that is the first place he went as soon as he get when i say as soon as i mean this is what i assumed from this past episodes anyway he went to macedonia and there he found out that there are certain false teachers they were teaching false doctrine in ephesus and so he sent or i mean sent timothy there or timothy was already in ephesus he told them to remain there we as i said that we don't have any clear uh, explanation either timothy was there 
or Timothy was with Paul, you know, uh, the first imprisonment, Timothy was with him. Probably he sent Timothy there uh, to go and teach. Because there are false teachers. If he was there, he told them to remain there and teach. Because the false teachers are spreading false doctrine uh, uh, in Ephesus. <clears throat> So if you, uh, I, will, I will read for you. First Timothy chapter 3, he says that although I, I'm, he was planning to go to Ephesus, also I was planning to visit, to come to you, and if I delay, delay, and you should know, I mean the people should know how they ought to behave in the house of God, which is the foundation and pillar of truth. What he's saying is, look, Timothy, you be there, there aren't certain false teachers are teaching false doctrine. But I want to come and correct that doctrine. But if I delay and you have to do things, you have to teach them how people should ought to behave in the house of God, which is the foundation and pillar of truth. You, because the church is based on the truth of God. You cannot distort the truth. So he is telling Timothy to stay there and to, te uh, to, to teach them. And that was the reason that he wrote 1 Timothy and sent to him. And another uh, epistle he wrote was Titus. If you read Titus, we know that he went to, he visited Crete. And he took Titus and he told him to remain there to settle some of the things going on there. And also he told uh, uh, Titus to appoint the elders in each cities, each assembly, churches. So we know that after he released from the prison, he went to Crete. And in Titus, he also says that he wanted to spend uh, winter in Nicopolis. The Nicopolis is actually the west coast of Greece. If you, in the most of your Bible, they have, we have uh, uh, the picture. You can see that. You can lay, uh, take and see that. And he wanted to spend a winter there. And then uh, that uh, Titus also says that he sent Xenas uh, uh, and Apollos there. And he told uh, Titus to rece receive him. And probably they were carrying the letter to, uh, to the Titus. <clears throat> and then uh, this epistle, the second Timothy, if you read, there at the end, chapter 4, we can see that he was planning to, uh, I mean, Paul traveled to Troas. And he told Timothy... Uh, when you come, you bring the clock because he is telling that, telling that to bring the blanket because he is in prison now, and uh, and also to bring the the scroll, the parchment. And in general, we can say that after he released from the prison, the first time, he visited Macedonia and also certain part of Asia, and he visited Corinth. And these are the, some of the general idea that we get from this pastoral epistle, the epistles that he has written after that. But one thing here, when he was writing the first Timothy and Titus, he was a free man. But when he is writing second Timothy, he is in prison. So we don't know how long he enjoyed that freedom. But the point is that it doesn't matter to him. Whether he's inside the prison or outside the prison. And he, this man is totally consumed with the mission of preaching the gospel. And now he is in prison. Now, one thing I wanted to tell you, when, you, when we normally hear about the prison, we get the idea of the prison 
uh, that we know. I mean, Bill can give an explanation about the, the prison and the prison system. And uh, that, is n that is not the kind of prison that Paul was. So I don't know many, I mean, I don't know if any, any, any of you visited Rome and uh, that particular place is still preserved there. And people can go and visit. I don't know if any of you visited. Normally, sometimes when you visited the Holy Land, they, some tour group, they included this place also. But i never been there. Anyway, I read a little bit about this because the Catholic Church sort of took over uh, this and made a big shrine out of, of this place. But it is, it's preserved there. And I read the description. Now here, this is what I read. And uh, it is a dungeon called the uh, Mamatin Dungeon. That's the name, still preserved there. Here is the description. It is a circular pit about 30 feet diameter and a hole at the top. So it, it, is, it is not the prison that we think of. Today, we are allowed to go down into the pit. If we go down, there is an altar built by a Roman Catholic Church. And in one section of the door, there is, uh, in, in, in one section, there is a door that is able to open and shut. This door is basically for execution purpose. Running alongside is a, a drainage system of the city of Rome. Once the door pulled open, the dungeon will, uh, will fill with water and drown the prisoners and wash them off. Then the door will be closed and make room for the next criminals. So this is the kind of prison that Paul, in the second time, it's so dark, so cold. Maybe that is the reason he told Timothy, uh, when you come back, you bring my blanket. <laughs> Probably that's the reason. And... Uh, in this difficult situation, you read the book, uh, you, you can just read, I mean, I don't know. Many times I read uh, uh, Second Timothy, and when we come to chapter 4, the middle, I have to stop. Because I don't have the mental balance to read the rest of the things. Because I get emotional. This great man in this pit. Anyway, I will come to that point a little later. When he was in this prison, we know some of his friends left him. And, uh, but at the same time, there are certain faithful uh, believers encourage him. One thing, if you read 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16 and 18, we read that. We, there we read... <clears throat> About Onesiphorus, we'll come to that a little later. But I just want to see that. And he visited, he is a, is a believer from Ephesus. He came to Rome and he came and about his, his visit, he said, he refreshed my mind. So just imagine in this pit, this great man, Paul, and the things that he was experiencing. This fellow believer, when he came, he said, you know, he's coming, refresh my heart. We, sometimes I think, why, how can you minister Paul? He's a spiritual giant. I don't need to go and uh, give some spiritual lesson to Apostle Paul. But you see, in this situation... And this brother, he made a visit and he said, he refreshed my heart. See, that kind of situation that he was going through. Beloveds, 
this is a practical lesson. When the believers are going through difficulties, it may not be the same way, same extent like Paul is going through, but when we are going through difficulties and issues in our life, you know, you know, sometimes we just go and say a word. You don't, you don't underestimate the, the, the significance, the impact of that kind of thing. Just to go and spend some time. You know, when I was taking these um, counseling courses, and they're talking about the grief counseling. I don't remember the term rightly. And uh, something really struck me. You know, when somebody is at uh, the time of grief, you just go and sit there. You don't need to talk anything. I said, that's a very important. Sometimes when you talk, we, we, insult, we, we, we add more pain. And he said, you just go and just to sit with him or her. It's a refreshing effect. So that is what, you know, here the great Paul, the spiritual giant, in this situation, he says that so and so visited me and he refreshed my heart. Don't ever estimate, underestimate what you can do to encourage other fellow believers. And, and uh, in the first, this time, the first, I, I already said, the first trial was sort of a religious nature because that time the accusation was he was spreading Christianity, which is actually a sect of Judaism. And Romans, they don't care about that. And even Judaism was sort of a, an acceptable religion. So they didn't care much care. That is why they, there was not much trouble when he was in the first, first imprisonment. It was a religious nature. But this time, it is a political uh, uh, nature. Because the Christians were accused of burning the city of Rome. Actually, Nero did that. Nero is ruling now. The Christians were accused of burning Rome. And here, the great leader of Christians, Paul. So the trial, he is waiting for imminent execution. And that is the condition here. That is why he said, uh, in when we come to the chapter 4, he said, I am already to be offered as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. And then he said that I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I kept faith. That means he 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 fully aware that his execution can happen any time. He is now there, wait for me a crown of righteousness that Lord the righteous judge can give me. So he is fully aware that any time the execution can happen. In that very difficult situation, read chapter 4 later. Many of his friends abandoned him. And he sent some of his fellow workers to different places. They assigned different places to do different duties. Only Luke was with him. But he wanted to see Timothy can come and one last time spend time with him. So he is asking Timothy, can you come one last time? Nobody is except Luke. We don't know whether Timothy could visit him before his execution? We don't know. But he wanted, desperately wanted, because in the first imprisonment, Timothy was with him. 
So he said, I am all alone physically and, and, and mentally in great agony. He asking Timothy to come one last time. You know, this is the time, when, when, when you come to chapter 3 of First Timothy, you can manage. When you come to chapter 4, you know, really I'm telling you that many times I had to stop in the middle of chapter 4 and then I had to close my Bible. Because it, it is so hard to read the rest of the things. I mean, you don't need to write now. I always take a pause and I want to take a pause right now. And one thing he says, he is not complaining much about the, the afflictions by the enemies of the Roman government. But there is something that really touched him. He said, all in Ephesus forsake me. You remember Paul's second missionary, second and third missionary journey. He established many churches in the Ephesus, that Asian area. You know, you that area we see, we read the seven churches and all. Anyway, that area. He ministered there. He stayed there for three years and established, and and uh, there are so many believers came. Now, in this difficult time, he's saying that they forsake me. Everyone in the province of Asia, it doesn't mean that they all departed of Christian faith. I, 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 we will see when we go to uh, chapters, uh, to the text. And then he mentions a couple of names also. Is saying about including uh, uh, Phygelus and Hermogenes. I don't know whether I name or, uh, pronounce that na the name correctly. You can pronounce whatever the way you want. That is. But he is saying even these people. I mean, when that speaks a lot. It's not a general statement. Even these people, even though we don't read, we can read in between the words. When you say that, even these people, that means they, they got so much blessings from Paul. Even they love me. Think about the person who is in this pit. This is great Paul. This is a great Paul. For him, everything is Christ. For him, everything is spread the gospel. The one who said, for me to live is Christ. The whole his life. He said, if I breathe and I want to do the work of the Lord. This man is abandoned by the believers. All alone in this pit, waiting for the execution. We don't know, as I said earlier, we don't know how, how long he was there in that pit. But Nero died AD 68. Sometimes before that, Paul was taken from this pit and brought to a place of his execution. That place also preserved now, which is called, it is on the Ostian Road. That is the name. I don't know where it is, but it is in Rome. There he laid his neck on a big rock. 
and he was decapitated by an axe. That is the end of this great man. He said, for everything is Christ. That is his life and ministry. He is the symbol of self-sacrifice service for the Lord. There are some more things I wanted to say, but I will pick next time. I don't want to take any extra minute because I, I, I try to decide, I don't know, to, to follow the clock. At least this is a new stat. At least the first, one, first, first time I need to follow that. <laughs> but think about Paul in this difficult situation. Great man. All alone in the prison. A totally committed to serve the Lord. For him to live is Christ. And he is asking Timothy, Timothy, come one time. This is the way that people serve the Lord. Even today, there are places people are ready to sacrifice their life for the sake of Christ. That is the commitment. So what is take away from here? This is. Whenever there is an opportunity to present the gospel, do it. You don't need to wait for an opportunity. Sometimes I'm, I'm so guilty of that. We, are, we, we think that, okay, this is not the right time, this is not the right time, this is not the right occasion. Whenever you can present the gospel, do it. That was the way that Paul did. It doesn't matter whether it's inside the jail, outside the jail. It's a favorable situation or unfavorable situations. There's only one goal. As I said earlier, it doesn't say that, oh, I was working hard and then I'm, let me take a break. No break for him. He was decapitated. The full satisfaction. I think that is the takeaway in this time. I'll pick next time. Oh, Father, we thank thee for scripture. Thank thee for the example of Paul. His commitment, his sacrifice, his endurance for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Christ. And when he come to the end of his life, he had the full satisfaction. I fought a good fight. Finished my course. Kept faith. Father, as after discussing and reading and thinking and talking about this, give us that passion in our hearts to serve you. Send us with that burden in our hearts. The remaining meeting, we ask you to speak to our hearts. Bless our time. We ask in the name of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ.